Hola, estimadas amigas y amigos del Vice. Quiero darles la más cordial bienvenida a este nuevo encuentro de nuestro seminario Puentes hacia el Futuro, que lleva en su segundo año y que quiere ser un espacio productivo de diálogo, de conocimiento, que nos ayude a transitar con más información, con más seguridad, hacia un futuro que a veces se nos presenta incierto, a la vez sorprendente. Queremos crear valor para la sociedad a través de conversaciones de actualidad con speakers de alta calidad, expertos académicos internacionales, para ayudar a descifrar mejor los cambios que están ocurriendo aceleradamente y asimismo entender qué nos depara el futuro. El amor por la excelencia, la actitud de servicio y el compromiso con nuestra comunidad, entendiendo por ella de forma amplia a nuestros colaboradores, sus familias, nuestros clientes, el entorno y por cierto nuestros accionistas, son algunos de los fundamentos más importantes para el banco y en esa actitud se sustenta esta iniciativa y estos seminarios. Esta se vuelve todavía más importante dado los tiempos que estamos viviendo con un país que está viviendo dos crisis de distintos ámbitos, una sanitaria y una social, que han removido nuestra sociedad desde lo más profundo hasta expresiones crudamente visibles de las que tenemos que hacernos cargo como sociedad. En este contexto lleno de incertidumbre genera muchas preguntas y Banco Vice ofrece a través de este seminario un espacio que esperamos nos permita reflexionar sobre aquellas preguntas con una mirada amplia desde distintas áreas del conocimiento, no solo la económica, que es aquella que es más natural para los bancos. En este contexto especial, el banco decidió realizar no solo una, sino dos conferencias internacionales. La primera que estamos transmitiendo hoy día presenta a Jonathan Haidt, psicólogo social estadounidense, profesor de liderazgo ético de la Universidad de Nueva York con investigaciones que se centran en la psicología de la moralidad y de las emociones. Él es uno de los investigadores más citados en estos temas. Sus charlas ahondan en la política y la polarización, donde analiza tendencias dañinas para la democracia, presentes tanto antes de la pandemia como ahora, y la forma en que esta última está cambiando estas tendencias. Haidt habla también sobre los liderazgos en tiempos de alta polarización, como aquellos que lamentablemente estamos viviendo en nuestro Chile. Estamos seguros de que Jonathan Haidt nos ayudará a comprender mejor estos procesos que estamos viviendo como sociedad y país y esperamos que nos entregue algunas pistas sobre situaciones que podríamos enfrentar en el futuro. La segunda conferencia que transmitiremos en octubre tendrá como exponente a Daniel Gilbert, uno de los principales expertos mundiales en ciencias de la felicidad y en los errores a veces en las tomas de decisiones diarias que afectan nuestro nivel de felicidad. Esperamos que estas conferencias sean un aporte para todos quienes tengan la oportunidad de escucharlas y que nos ayuden a enfrentar los desafíos que tenemos por delante. Que así nos ayuden a seguir avanzando para lograr un Chile en el que estemos todos comprometidos, en el que queramos vivir todos, en el que quepamos todos y del cual estemos todos orgullosos. Bienvenidos nuevamente y muchas gracias por su confianza y compromiso con el Banco Vice. Well, thank you so much, Alberto. It's, it's a pleasure to be here at this seminar hosted by Banco Vice. Uh, it's especially a pleasure for me because I spent a lovely two weeks in Chile in uh, December of 2019. Um, I came with my family and we had just a fantastic time down in uh, Torres del Paine and Punta Arenas. Uh, my children saw animals that they had never seen before. And I was so well hosted. I was uh, I was brought down as a guest of the Centro de Estudios Públicos and Harold Beyer. Uh, I was also hosted uh, by um, uh, by Al uh, Alvaro Fisher and Jimena Katz, and uh, also by Nicolas Ibanez and La Otra Mirada. Uh, so I love Chile. I think you are the most promising country in Latin America. I know you're now undergoing a process of a constitutional convention, uh, which is a very, very challenging affair. I want you to be successful. And in my talk today, I'm going to uh, make four points, uh, four points from social psychology and moral psychology, uh, four points that I hope will help you uh, as you think as a country about what you're doing and where you are. And for all of you running organizations or raising children in this complicated and very strange time. So let's begin. These are the four points. The first is that democracy is much harder than we thought. So very, very big picture. I'd like you to think about the entire history of the universe, about uh, 14 billion years old. And there's a funny thing about the early universe that after the Big Bang for about uh, 400 million years, there was nothing. There was no matter. It was just energy. Uh, and then all of a sudden, 
something congeals and we get stars, we get matter, we get life, we get humanity. And when physicists discovered this, they realized that this didn't need to happen. Uh, that is, as the famous physicist Stephen Hawking put it, the laws of science contain many fundamental numbers, like the size of the electric charge and all those other numbers that you might have learned in your physics class. And he observed that the remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. Now, that's an amazing thought that had some of these parameters been just a tiny bit different, matter would not have congealed and we would not have life. We would not be here. And this has led some people to posit uh, that, well, who set those parameters? It must have been God. God might have set those parameters to guarantee that we could exist. Now, I'm not here to discuss intelligent design or God. I'm using this as a metaphor, a metaphor for thinking about liberal democracy, because a successful liberal democracy is about as unlikely as our universe is. <clears throat> and here I'm drawing on the biologist Edward O. Wilson, uh, and while well, he didn't say this, but this is essentially what his work suggests, that humans are tribal primates, that we evolved for life in small fission fusion societies, things that break apart and come together. Uh, with animistic religion and violent intergroup conflict. And therefore, uh, you might say that we humans are unsuited for life in large, diverse, secular societies, unless you get certain settings finely adjusted to make possible the development of stable political life. So we have to see a stable democracy as also something of a miracle that shouldn't happen, but it can happen if you get parameters just right. Now, the founding fathers of the United States who thought deeply about how do you create a country that can be stable without a king, without an emperor, how do you do this? And James Madison was the principal author of our constitution and his top fear was the human tendency to faction or division or groupishness and groupish conflict. He said, we, these groups are animated by passions and he used metaphors of fire, that fire start and it burns everything up. We're so angry at each other. We don't think about the common good. And here's a quote he wrote, hence it is that such democracies, meaning direct democracies, have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. So the American founding fathers did not give us a democracy. They didn't like democracy. They gave us a republic with democratic features. The people have to be able to get rid of the leaders if they don't like them. But you don't want policy to be made by the people. They'll be torn apart by passions and they'll make very, very bad policies. Uh, and so in the United States, we can kind of think of the men who wrote our constitution as being like God doing intelligent design for a political universe. And the Constitution is the political universe that they gave us. Now, in the 1990s, the whole world, or much of the world, I should say, um, thought that liberal democracy, perhaps on the American model, was the end point of history. This famous book, The End of History by Francis Fukuyama, not that there would be no more history, but that the big battle of what form of government should we have, communism, fascism, or liberal democracy was won, and the answer was clearly liberal democracy. That's what we thought in the 1990s after the Iron Curtain fell. Well, in the 21st century, it's not looking so good. Um, history really started back up in a sense uh, in 2016 with the unexpected votes of, of Brexit uh, in the UK, Donald Trump's victory in the United States, but related to a wave of populism and populist divisions in Europe, uh, in Asia, in India, the Philippines, uh, uh, populist movements in Latin America as well. We had the extraordinary spectacle last January of a populist uh, um, uprising and attack on the US Capitol. And we've had um, a year and a half now, a uh, year of, of major, major protests, many of which are violent. Uh, so some coming from the left, some coming from the right. Uh, and now, of course, in Chile, you've had, uh, since before the pandemic, you also have had extraordinary political uprisings, protests, disorder. 
um, uh, uh, protesting important, important things. Uh, but you too are experiencing the difficulties um, of democracy. It is not easy. Um, Isabella just sent me this, this uh, survey data from CEP. Uh, you're having uh, confidence in almost all of your institutions dropping, as we are in the United States, as most democracies are. Democracy is hard. And again, I think we are unsuited for life in a large, diverse, secular society unless we can get certain settings finally adjusted to make possible the development of stable political life. The margins of error on these parameters may be lower than we thought. Uh, so when we think about who can change these parameters, because it feels as though the, the, the political and social universe changed in the last 10 years. Things are really different than they were 20 or 30 years ago. Who has the power to change the laws of the universe? And I would suggest only one person, Mark Zuckerberg, meaning at least social media, new social networks, massively change the parameters of our political life. And that's my second point. Social media makes democracy much harder. Uh, I'd like to start with the story of the Tower of Babel uh, in, in the Hebrew Bible, where God sees humans building a giant tower and he says, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And I believe that is what happened to us between 2009 and 2012. We are now in the aftertime and our intuitions about what works are no longer valid from the before time, before 2009. Let me explain. Uh, in 2019, I wrote an article in The Atlantic called The Dark Psychology of Social Networks, trying to explain how social media has interfered with democracy and made it much, much more difficult and unstable. Uh, social media has changed four parameters of our social universe. Hyperconnectivity, public performance, our communication is now not authentic, it's more public performance for others to rate. Um, any sort of outrage is contagious, and it severs our links to the past. Young people in particular don't know much about the 20th century or anything really before about 2010. I won't cover all of those, but I just want to give you a sense of how rapidly life has changed. So suppose this was your social network. This happens to be a map of cell phone networks in Europe in the 1990s, but whatever. Imagine that this was a map of your social world. And then in the space of about five or seven years, it changed to this. Uh, this is also a map of those networks several years later. This might be good. You might think it's great for everyone to be connected with everyone, but it would change everything radically to be disconnected. And this is what happened to us between 2009 and 2012. The social media platforms originally that emerged around 2004 were not particularly polarizing and they weren't that popular. It's not until about 2009 that people uh, in America and then around the world are flooding onto Facebook. Facebook wins the battle, it becomes the global social network. By 2018, there were two billion people. We were all connected to each other. Now, before 2009, these networks were not polarizing. People just displayed who they were, what bands they liked, that sort of thing. Um, Friendster, MySpace, the Facebook originally. But in these three years, everything changes because the parameters of human connectivity were changed. In 2009, Facebook added the like button, and this was the transformation. Twitter copied it right away. Also, Twitter added the retweet button, and Facebook copied it with its share function right away. Now the two platforms have huge amounts of information about user engagement, and so now they can algorithmicize, they use algorithms to maximize how attractive it is to eyeballs. And now people become much more addicted, they flood onto social media. But what is it that causes engagement? Emotions, especially negative emotions, especially anger. So by uh, 2010, 2011, people are getting a lot of outrage material every day sent to them by the algorithms. Uh, in 2012, now the news media begins optimizing its headlines to get people to view their headlines. And social media and the older news media become intertwined with stories about each other and links about each other. Um, and once, once social media becomes the place where everything happens and where all the journalists are, now we have this gigantic, gigantic 
outrage machine that the Russians began using in 2014 to damage Western democracies, especially the United States. So in the aftertime, this is our life. Anyone can see anything, and if they're angry at it, they craft a response, they retweet it, they post it with content to make it even more enraging. So now we have angrier and more polarized citizens who are doing more moral display or moral grandstanding about ever more engaging news on platforms designed to spread outrage. This is why I think everything has changed after 2012. We are now in the after time. If we look at who retweets what, we see that at least in the United States, uh, on, uh, on Twitter, this is a map of Twitter, who's connected to who in terms of retweets, uh, we are divided into two separate worlds that have very little to do with each other. Now, you are uh, already beginning your constitutional convention, a very, very hard thing to do. In the United States, when we had ours back in uh, 1787, um, there was no social media. They met in a closed session in Philadelphia and they reported out the results. You are going to have much more transparency, I believe. And that sounds good, but it might be bad. That is, it's important for people to understand what's going on. But the people inside the convention, they have to come to trust each other. Now, they don't trust each other now. Your country is very divided, as many are. And you have a lot of diversity of opinions and political groups. And if each of them are thinking about their constituents and what people are saying on Twitter, they are never going to be able to trust each other and work together, and especially they will not be able to compromise. So your con a convention is always hard. Yours will be much harder because of Twitter in particular. Uh, so be careful about having too much transparency where your delegates are thinking not about communicating with each other, but about what others are saying about them. Now, uh, if that wasn't hard enough, my third point is that Gen Z, that is, people or kids born after 1996 are going to make it even harder. Uh, so I wrote a book, I'm the co-author of a book, Malcriando a los Jóvenes Estadounidenses. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago in uh, 2018 in the United States, 2019 in Chile. Uh, and here's the way to think about what's happened to our children, to Gen, to Gen Z. The most fundamental question in life is not, is there a God? or what's the meaning of life. The most fundamental question in life is approach versus avoid. Because as soon as life began to move, organisms had to adapt to figure out which way to move. Do you approach this temperature gradient or avoid that carbon dioxide concentration? And the rest of evolution is largely attempts to optimize that with brain developments and bot developments for movement. So a fish has a much larger brain than a paramecium uh, with, or with parts specialized for perception and movement. The human brain is massively specialized with a whole stretch of front left cortex specialized for approach emo motivations, positive emotions and approach. The front right is specialized for fear, withdrawal, avoidance. And we can describe what this feels like as being in discover mode when your uh, approach circuits are activated and being in defend mode when your avoidance circuits are activated. In discover mode, we're looking for opportunities. We feel like a kid in a candy shop where we think for ourselves and we wanna do things that will make us grow. In defend mode, we can switch into it very quickly when we perceive a threat. Suddenly, our brain is scanning everywhere for threats and dangers. We have a scarcity mindset. There's not enough. I've got to guard what I have. I will cling to my team for protection against them. And if we can defeat them, we win. Now, what happened to us on campus in the United States is that suddenly in 2014, we had all these students coming in who were in defend mode. So all of a sudden, we had students asking for trigger warnings. If you're going to make us read a book that has violence or sexual violence in it, you have to warn us. You can't just give us a novel or a Greek myth. We have to be prepared for what we're going to read. This was very strange to us as professors. We'd not seen this before, but suddenly in 2014, many students were asking for this. And students were protesting speakers that they didn't have to go see. They said, this will be dangerous if this person speaks on our campus. And they asked for safe spaces. Again, if a speaker's coming to campus, it's dangerous. We need a place to be safe, even though we don't have to go to the talk. So this was very strange. Um, 
there wasn't violence at first, but by 2017, we were seeing violence on campus to stop people from speaking that were thought to be dangerous. So my friend Greg Lukianoff and I wrote this up into a book called The Coddling of the American Mind, because what we saw on campus was these features. Talk about safe spaces, trigger warnings, microaggressions, bias response teams to punish microaggressions, the idea that speech is violence, the idea that everything should be analyzed through a lens of power and power structures, and a call-out culture done mostly on social media where you attack people, lots of people attack somebody, often for a single word that they use. This was a very strange moral pattern that came out of nowhere, it seemed, all over campus. And then, since then, around 2018, it spread into the corporate world, it spread into our high schools, it's spreading all over, and it's spreading to other countries. But to return to our story, what happened to us in 2014 is that suddenly the students coming in, well, when they were millennials, born 1982 to 1995, they had relatively low rates of psychological disorders and other disorders. But when Gen Z comes in around 2013, 2014, suddenly the rates of psychological disorders triple. Our mental health centers were all flooded suddenly. They weren't flooded in 2012 by 2015, they were flooded. We couldn't handle the number of depressed and anxious students that were coming in. It wasn't just on college. National data from the United States shows that the rates for millennials were these numbers here, 4% for males, 12% for females. But when Gen Z comes in, the rates go up for boys and way up for girls. Uh, depression and anxiety only, not schizophrenia, not bipolar disorder, just Gen Z has much, much higher rates of depression and anxiety. And it's not just self-report, they also have higher rates of suicide and higher rates of self-harm, cutting themselves to hurt themselves deliberately. Now, why is this happening at the same time in multiple countries? It's happening in Canada, the UK, uh, um, uh, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, it's not as clear in Europe or Latin America, although there's some signs of it, um, but it hits girls the heart. Now, why? Well, one of the reasons is that social media came in at this time, or rather social media changed. So in 2006, Facebook opened up to the world, before then you had to be a college student. Uh, in 2007, the iPhone comes out, but most teenagers don't have one. In 2009, as I said, Facebook adds the like button and Twitter adds the retweet button. And when we see, what we see on this graph is the number of, uh, the percentage of 12th graders, roughly 17 or 18 years old, who are on social media every day. And we see that between 2009 and 2011, that's when they flooded onto social media. They all joined uh, uh, Facebook and especially Instagram. And th the wave of depression started right after that. Social media also explains the sex difference. And this is especially important for those of you with daughters, uh, uh, daughters under the age of 18. If you still have some influence on them, be very careful about social media. Uh, girls use social media far more than boys. Um, Boys are on their screens all day long too, but they're doing video games, which are not harmful to their mental health. Social media is harmful to girls' mental health, in part because girls are more affected by social comparison, especially of their bodies. And Instagram puts the focus on, on their whole bodies and their beauty. Their friends are using filters to make themselves look thinner and more beautiful. So most girls feel that they are uglier than average, uglier than their friends. Instagram in particular is, is very bad for teen girls' mental health. Girls are also more affected by the fear of missing out and the fear of being left out, which social media fosters. You see your friends all having fun without you. And finally, boys and girls are equally aggressive, but boys' aggression is physical, the threat of violence. And when they move online, they can't do that. But girls' aggression has always been social. They damage each other's relationships and reputations. Social media allows them to do that 24 hours a day, even on weekends, anonymously. So social media is a big part of why things are going haywire, things are going crazy for teen mental health and for democracy. But there's another factor that's very important just for children, for Gen Z, which is that people are anti-fragile. Our children are not fragile. As Friedrich Nietzsche said, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Now, of course, there are exceptions to that rule, but in general, human beings are anti-fragile. As Nassim Taleb uh, wrote this brilliant book called Anti-Fragile, um, things that are fragile break, so we protect them from breakage. Things that are resilient don't break, so we can drop a plastic cup, it won't break, but it doesn't get better. There are certain systems, though, 
that need to be shocked, challenged, face uh, disturbances, and, vary and a lot of variability. Uh, so bones and the immune system and children, they, none of them will work if you protect them too much, if you don't stress them sometimes. Our children look fragile. We have an urge to protect them. But if we do that, we have to always be protecting them because they don't have a chance to face dangers on their own, to face challenges, to get lost and find their way home. They need to learn their capabilities. And at least in the United States, most of us now are helicopter parents. We're always there to protect them. We think the world is too dangerous to let them out. And as a consequence, we have to always be there for them. We don't let them practice independence. But research shows that if you don't let young mammals play, all mammals play when they're young, to wire up their brains and test their capabilities and expand them. If you don't let them play, they're like more likely to become depressed and anxious. And that's what we have done. Gen Z, kids born in 1996 and later, is much more in defend mode than in explore mode. They have much less life experience. They've been sheltered or protected. They have much higher rates of depression, anxiety, and fragility. They entered universities around 2013 in the United States. Chile may be a year or two behind. Many countries are a year or two behind these problems in the United States. And they entered the corporate world in 2018, uh, which if this is happening in Chile means that they will be entering the corporate world right around now, uh, a much more fragile younger generation. Um, uh, businesses are noticing this, that their young workers are stressed out and anxious. Experts say that Gen Z isn't prepared for the workplace. So this is causing huge problems in American businesses, not all industries, but industries that hire from our elite colleges, industries that are creative or knowledge work. Uh, and so I just want to bring your attention to the fact that while you seem to be proud of the fact, or, you, or in Chile, it seems to be thought a good thing that you have so many younger members um, that seems more democratic um, at your constitutional convention, uh, but especially those in their 20s, so Gen Z and also the younger millennials, so those under 30, on average are going to be more in defend mode. And if you're in defend mode, it's very difficult to compromise or trust. You take offense at everything. So this also might make your convention more difficult. So I'd like to close with just a few suggestions for how to think about this. Conflict is very, very difficult to escape. Um, there's a brilliant book out, uh, just came out uh, a, a few uh, weeks ago, uh, called The Way Out by Peter Coleman, uh, just out in, in English in the United States. And he helps us think about intractable conflict, conflict that goes on for decades. How does this start? And he gives us the example of two strangers sitting next to each other at a bar, at a counter. And one of them accidentally bumps his elbow into the other. Well, when you first meet someone, things could go either way. They could either become very friendly or they could become hostile very quickly. And he gives the example of how uh, in this case, there, there are various ways this interaction could have gone. It could have gone friendly into a couple of different spots. Uh, he's trying to help us think about relationships as complex, dynamical systems that can change configuration. So if you think of the ball here as where the relationship is, it could have gone into one of these spots of stable, minor friendship. But in this case, it goes into a deeper hole of conflict or dislike. And he traces out how the interactions of these two men over the next hour could lead to a much deeper hole. Think about social space as having areas that are that are like wells or holes that once you get in, it's hard to get out of. And the deeper it is, the harder it is to get out of. And if they have any sort of conflict between them or between them and uh, between their friends and the other person's friends, you can get a major conflict between to uh, two people or two groups. The deeper the hole is, the harder it is to move the ball out of this co condition and into a better condition. Um, and so think about your think about Chilean society as a complex dynamical system where you have deep attractors, you have deep attractors of conflict. Of course, you have your unique political history with the Pinochet regime, and you have many divisions now, as all democracies do. Uh, but you are in a hole, just like America is in a hole. Uh, the United States is in a hole. I don't know how we're going to get out of ours. I have some ideas for what might help in the United States. But I'd like to just uh, close with, well, how do you get the ball out of the hole? If the hole is very deep, it's almost impossible. It takes enormous force to get the ball out. So you have to think about parameter changes. 
things that would make the hole less deep. And then it's it's not as hard to push the ball out of the bad spot and into a, a, a more uh, respectful, friendly, cooperative uh, kind of relationship. Um, so again, um, liberal democracy is hard unless you get certain settings finely adjusted. You have to get things right and then things can proceed. And so I'll just end with these suggestions uh, that I think would help your constitutional convention to be more successful and that would help any group you participate in. Anytime you are having negotiations or conflict at work or with your neighbors, whatever it is, anything you can do that increases trust within the group. And that means they have to have a lot of time together in small to medium groups with nobody watching, not so that they're not performing for outsiders. They are focused on each other. Humans are good at developing trust, but it takes time, weeks or months or years. You can't do it in just a few minutes or hours. Um, so do whatever you can to increase trust within the group. Um, do things together that are off, that are not about work. Go bowling together, drinking together, do all sorts of things to foster a human connection. And then you can talk about politics. Be careful about transparency. If all of your sessions were open to the public and people could see on social media, I can guarantee you, you will, you will not be successful. Uh, in the US Congress, we brought in cameras, thinking transparency was good. What happened? Nobody actually talks on the floor of the Congress anymore. They just talk to the camera. Uh, you have to encourage a sense of shared past and shared future. You have to guarantee procedural fairness. People have to trust that the system they're taking part in is impartial and it's not uh, a conspiracy against them. Uh, and be very careful that you don't take on North American identity politics. This is fatal to cooperation. In the United States, we are now obsessed with identity and we see uh, many young people are taught to see people as, be, uh, as being located on various binary dimensions uh, and the ones above the line are morally bad. They are the ones with power, power is oppression. These people are the bad people. Below the line are the morally good people. They are the oppressed people. If you adopt this system, this identity obsessed system from the United States, which is spreading in many parts of the world, um, you will have complete moral conflict because you have what we call common enemy identity politics, where most people are, tr you try to unite most people in hatred of the bad people who are heterosexual white males because they are the ones with power. Now, of course, though, there's some truth to this that the people in powerful positions in Western countries tend to be white males. Uh, but if you assume that they are bad and evil and trying to oppress, you are just going to have constant conflict. You can't reach compromise, you can't work together, uh, and you can't improve systems. Um, instead, aim for common humanity identity politics. This is what Martin Luther King preached and other uh, civil rights leaders such as Pauli Murray, uh, who said, I intend to destroy segregation by positive and embracing methods, but my brothers try to draw a circle to exclude me, I shall draw a larger circle to include them, humanize people, then they drop their guard, they trust, and they work together to improve systems. And finally, even though I focused on how systems are where the power is, how we have to change parameters of systems, each one of us is an individual citizen in a democracy, and how we behave adds up to how the whole group feels and acts towards each other. And so uh, because of my study of moral psychology, and because I see what social media is doing to us to magnify outrage since 2012, I urge everyone to take the outrage reduction pledge. We are choking on outrage. There is way too much anger and outrage and is not productive. It just leads to paralysis and hatred. So I hope you will uh, perhaps say out loud with me, uh, if you're willing to read this uh, in English. Um, uh, so number one, I will give less offense. Number two, I will take less offense. And number three, I will pass on less offense. I will not contribute to the, to the, the uh, overabundance, the choking on outrage that our societies are now suffering from. And so with that, um, I, I, I hope these four points will help you understand why democracy and cooperation are hard and getting harder. And I wish you all the best in your efforts to improve your democracy. Thank you. So 
John, thank you so much for your presentation. As always with your books and with this talk, it's very illuminating and I think we will re reflect upon what you just presented for 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 much or for the coming months actually. Um, you mentioned uh, the importance of uh, what you called certain settings being finely adjusted for democracy to work. And I believe that one of those certain settings is political parties, actually. Uh, democracy has always worked with political parties, but what we have seen in Chile and also in other countries in Latin America, for example, is uh, political parties being highly questioned, uh, exhibiting low trust, but also being sort of blamed for uh, what is going on. And, and I think uh, we have, of, uh, uh, or we're in the midst of a crisis of representation. Uh, so what would you say are um, some of the key challenges to solve this political representation crisis, especially in times of social media? So um, how do we sort of retune these certain settings uh, that are crucial for representative democracy to work? Great question, because that is one of the most powerful levers or, or settings that you can change. So Madison's fear was that when you have factions, you have groups or parties that are focused on fighting each other, all they want to do is defeat the other. They don't think about the common good. They don't think about what's good for the country. In the United States, in our Congress, each congressperson is chosen by a primary election held just by that party. And so they are, to the extent they care about the election, they don't care about the overall election by all the citizens. They care mostly about their closed party primary. And so breaking that apart is the most important thing we can do in the United States. Now, it, so that when they are in office, when they are in power, they are thinking, I need to appeal to everybody in my district, not just the people in my party, the voters in my party. So in Chile, how are the is it deputados? What are the Congress people? What are they called? Uh, diputados, senadores. Okay, okay diputados, senadores. Um, how are they chosen before the election? Does the party choose them or is there some sort of an election to choose them? We have uh, districts, uh, so the country is divided upon in districts and then people get nominated um, from the parties uh, and we have sort of a proportional system. Okay, but the parties choose people and once they're in office, once they're elected, what are they most concerned about? Are they most concerned about what the people they represent think? Or are they most concerned about what the people on Twitter think? Or are they most concerned about what the members of their party think? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I would say that over the last few years, we have seen sort of a, a, a big issue with uh, the use of social media for during the legislative, legislative process, right? Uh, that we didn't have that before. But also I would say, and you see this in Chile and of course in other countries, that coalitions or political coalitions, um, which uh, sort of would be what happens be be inside your Republican or and Democratic Party are much more fragile. Yes. Uh, right. So they used to be very well organized and now they tend sort of to break apart as the legis legislative process progresses. Well, that's right, so because compromise is very hard and um, uh, what, in my experience, politicians at the top level are very socially skilled. The people in our Congress tend to have very good social sense. That's how they rose up um, through the through the through the party through the ranks. And it used to be that politicians could work out deals between each other because they were very socially skilled. But now that everything is more public and there's social media, now if anyone works at a deal with another. They will be destroyed on social media and they will be accused of being a traitor to the party or a traitor to the cause. So you have to look very carefully and talk to your deputados and senadores. Most of them probably want to do good for Chile, but they feel they can't. They can't do things that they know are right because of what people will say. So how can you give them more protection from, from these forces? How can you make it so that compromise actually makes them more likely to get reelected? rather than less. And of course, it's very hard to control or change social media. That's very hard. Um, but think about coalitions. Why do they break apart? What are they afraid of? Uh, uh, and so 
think about the way your political system has changed to make those coalitions harder to keep together. Now, trust in institutions is a big one that allows people to compromise. In the United States, if you are now the minority party, if you if you don't control the chamber, you have nothing. You have no rights. You can't do anything. That's terrible. The minority party should have some ability to have input into laws. Uh, and so look at Look at what makes people desperate when they are not in control. Um, so that's so looking at how the legislature functions is a crucial area for parameter setting. And, and also um, sort of part of the issues that we're discussing is how to make political parties or traditional political parties um, more in tune with the social demands. Right. Um, part of the analysis is that the political leadership uh, sort of got very um, sort of um, disadjusted from what was happening in reality. And so how can we bring uh, political leaders back to the social demands and make the necessary changes? We see this, for example, in the discussion on our pension system or our health system, uh, which has been sort of lagging for many, many years, but we see no reform. Um, so would you say that in those terms, social media can be used? Uh, I know you're very contrary to social media, but some people would say, you know what? It's a it's a system that it can bring political leaders back in tune with, for example, younger people uh, or make them more attractive to the, junior, the new generations. Well, social media is very, very good at destroying things, but it's not very good at building anything. And that's one of the reasons democracies are now much more unstable is that democracy always it, we, we talk about it as being like making sausage the, the final product is good but you don't want to see it being made you don't want to know what goes into a sausage and it's the same with politics so the more transparency the more everything is talked about on social media the, you can't make any more sausage that way <clears throat> now uh, i understand what you're saying i think there's a very big problem about money and social class where uh, in your country and in my country, we have much more influence of, of a more free market ideology, um, which is related to our high levels of prosperity, but it also means that our, the rich are getting richer at a very fast rate, and they no longer are connected to the concerns of most of the country. So this is, this is one of the difficulties of a modern liberal democracy, is that money can corrupt it and if you have a free market system that enables rich people to have much more influence then you are going to get less trust from those who are not rich so in both of our countries we need to think of democracy as being like an operating system that if it's a good one generates a lot of prosperity people can do things on this amazing operating system but as with every operating system, <clears throat> there are many hackers. People figure out a way to exploit it and to take value from others. Uh, so um, uh, I'm not sure what to do in the case of Chile per se, but, um, but I think um, shared sacrifice is very important when times are tough. If everyone, uh, if everyone sacrifices or everyone goes down, then there's more trust. But uh, in the United States, during the pandemic, many people went down, but those who the, the wealthiest people went way, way up. And so that's the sort of thing that also uh, uh, reduces trust in the system. I think it's more important that people feel the political system is responsive to them than it is that they feel the political system looks like them. So just having people who look like you, I mean, young people or people of color, if the government is dysfunctional, I don't think that helps. But having a government that actually seems to be trying to to help the people in need rather than just fighting with each other or rewarding their donors, their political donors, uh, I think that that would lead to more trust. And and sort of moving to the to the younger generations, because uh, that's obviously an important part of your research. Um, and, and its relationship to democracy, because what we see in Chile or what polls show us, um, I'm going to use Encuesta CEP, um, it's that younger generations as well as older generations are both very much in favor of democracy as a system compared to, for example, authoritarian uh, regimes. 
but younger generations are much more critical of how democracy is working, of its performance, right? Um, so you showed, right, the current trends in democracy across the world, or at least the Western world. And what, what, what would you think is the impact of uh, this current situation in the formative years, right? In, in teenagers or, or early 20s, uh, where you're sort of starting to understand and participate in democracy, especially, for example, in voting. Um, we see that in Chile, I'm going to use the latest uh, elections, uh, younger generations participated less. Uh, well, we had a, a, a very low level of participation in general. But how how would you sort of re-enchant uh, younger generations with participating in the traditional ways? Or maybe it's that um, cause-related movements, as you mentioned in the US and we also see in Chile, are going to be sort of much more present in politics than they were in the previous decades. Right. So. Uh the, the point I, I opened my talk with was that democracy is much harder than we thought. Now, the founding fathers in the 18th century knew that democracy was very hard, very unstable. And in the 19th century, um, American democracy was also uh, a, a, not a beautiful thing, not things that Europeans looked at and said, wow, we want that. But World War II, but the 20th century was an incredible century uh, a very dramatic century with two gigantic wars. And the victor was the United States. The United States uh, uh, emerged as clearly the, the correct country, the country that had the right system, all the prosperity, all the creativity, dominating popular culture. Uh, in the United States, um, uh, 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 we, we um, well, a war brings people together. So World War II, created enormous um, uh, faith and trust in each other in America and Canada and the UK and many countries that participated. Um, and the fact that uh, the America dominated system won the Cold War as well. Um, what we find then is that uh, people who are over about 40 or so um, think that democracy is great, but younger people um, don't in the United States. And what I mean by that is when you, uh, one of the questions is how important is it to live in a democracy um, and people, uh, uh, people who remember the 20th century in the United States say very important, it's crucial. But if you were born after 1980, 1985, you never saw our American democracy work well. It's always been a mess. It's dysfunctional. We can't do anything anymore. So young people say it's not that important. So we have a very big split in the United States uh, because our older people saw democracy work. And the key, as you suggested, the key is what did it look like when you were between the ages of 16 and 24? There's research to suggest that however the world looks to you then, that kind of gets imprinted in your mind and that will affect your politics for the rest of your life. Now, of course, in Chile, you have the much more recent experience of an authoritarian regime. So it's not surprising to me that even your young people agree that authoritarian is bad, democracy is good. So your historical experience will give you different views, um, certainly, um, away from authoritarianism. Um, it's very, very important that young people in Chile today see that democracy is working, they see that it is delivering, they see that it is a path forward. So if this convention fails, if it, if it, if it seems that democracy is weak, that bringing people together leads to nothing, just fighting, then I think it's going to be much harder to have a democracy 10, 20, 30 years from now, because your young people will be much more anti-democratic. And and also um, one of the issues that, that that we have seen in Chile, particularly with the social outburst of uh, 2019, um, is that um, the the use of violence, right, and the and the toleration of violence within a, a democracy. So what we see is that, for example, um, younger people supported or at least tolerated violence. Um, different polls show this. Uh, sort of much more than the older generations, right? Um, again, I'm going to use Encuesta Set, but it showed that uh, around more than 70% of younger people, that's between the ages of 18 to 24, supported <laughs> protests and manifestations, including those that uh, had violence in it. So do you observe this uh, phenomenon in other countries as well? Um, sort of the, the, at least the, maybe not the support, but at least um, not condemning violence uh, or, and its use in a democratic environment? 
yes, we have the same thing in the United States where older people condemn the use of violence. Um, young people say, well, they would not, most of them say they would not be violent themselves, but they would approve of, or they would at least accept the use of violence by others. So in part, this is a function of age. Young people tend to be more radical and more open to radical ideas. They don't see the value of order as much, uh, but what I'm afraid will happen and what I will, what I predict will happen is when people see social disorder, they see the country coming apart, and especially when there's violence, this tends to activate the authoritarian dynamic. That is um, uh, work by the political scientist Karen Stenner on authoritarianism shows that about one third of the population is prone to authoritarianism. That doesn't mean that they're always authoritarian, but it means when they see violent chaos, when they see things coming apart, it's as though someone pushed a button in their head, which makes them say, kick out the deviants, punish crime, put a strong person in power. We've got to crush this, this disorder. We must have order. And we must, we must have a community with order where people share values. So violent protest generally backfires. Any side that uses violent protest. Now, there are times when it has to be done. There are times when violent protest to overthrow a dictator is, is useful. But at least within a democracy, research in the United States shows that violent protest tends to alienate most of the people who observe it. And it makes them much more willing to vote for the right, to vote for a, a, a conservative candidate, and especially an authoritarian candidate. And so violence begets authoritarian violence. Um, so this is also a, a bad sign. Now, obviously, there are real economic inequalities. The system is not working for young people or for poor people in Chile. Again, I don't know in detail, but from what I've read in the newspapers, there are real economic problems that need to be resolved. Uh, but I fear that the use of violence will make it harder to resolve them. And, and sort of um, what, what, staying in the formative years, um, the formative years are being now lived in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, so the teenagers and, and the early sort of college people are enjoying themselves at home, actually. So they are not socializing and they're stuck up with their parents mostly, um, which is what every teenager doesn't want, at least. Um, so how would you say the pandemic will sort of maybe, or what trends are you observing now in terms of, of these younger generations, um, for example, that are going to enter the workforce in the... I don't know, a couple of more years. So how's the pandemic sort of, what are you observing in the US at least in right. terms of the impact? Yeah, so if the pandemic had not happened, we already know that the young people growing up are more depressed, anxious, and fragile, easily frightened, easily discouraged. Now we have a pandemic and we're coming out of the pandemic. We're going to see young people anxious, depressed, and easily frightened. And we're going to think it was because of the pandemic but we don't really know what effects the pandemic had. The pandemic will have very variable effects. In the United States, wealthy families took their kids out to their beach house and the kids could run on the beach with other kids. They'll probably be fine. But in poor neighborhoods, they were now crowded together at home. They often didn't have a computer to, to, take, to do school remotely. Um, so I think we're going to see very variable effects of the pandemic for rich children, probably no harm, and it might be some benefit if they had kids to play with, because play is much more important than school. Um, but kids who had to just stay at home uh, or stay at home and do social media with their friends, them, for them, I think we will see more depression. We do see more depression uh, in kids in the United States right now. Um, so I think that things will get uh, largely worse. Oh, the other thing is we've been telling our children in the United States that the world is more and more dangerous when in fact it's gotten safer and safer since the 1990s. Much lower levels of crime, much many fewer drunk drivers, many fewer sexual predators, we've, we've put them in jail now. So the world has gotten safer and safer for our children, but they think it's more and more dangerous. And then the pandemic came, when we told our kids, oh, don't touch, you'll get sick. Oh my God, don't go there. Oh, you know, stay away from people. So I think that the pandemic is basically going to amplify the problems the mental health problems of Gen Z. They will be more fearful, more depressed, more anxious, more on the on average. But, what, but also, what, what, what do you think? I mean, you've 
you know. No, no. I, I, I was thinking that um, you sort of mentioned a lot of times during the presentation the importance of socializing, right? Of of you you mentioned, for example, the importance of play uh, with for all mammals. And what, what the pandemic has done is that it has eliminated that, right? Uh, at least those who have brothers or sisters play among themselves or fight among themselves, I must say. Uh, but but sort of we have reduced the in-person interactions for younger children, but also for teenagers. So, so one of the questions that I have is how, sort of how will, for example, they will start talking again with people who come from very different origins when they have been stuck at home uh, in mostly in very difficult conditions uh, and sort of how will they what those interactions will come upon and how can we facilitate those interactions um, yeah, good, good. sort of removing phones and talking to I don't know classmates they haven't seen in over a year but imagine those who enter college next year uh, people who don't know, who come from different origins, and who, and how will that socializing uh, start again? That's right. So even before the pandemic, um, we saw that the more connected a generation is, the lonelier they are. So Gen Z is by far the loneliest generation ever because they are the most connected um, by social media. Those are not real connections. Those are not good connections. Young mammals need to play with each other Young children need to play physically, they need to run, they need to wrestle, they need to fight, they need to learn how to make up. So in-person interaction, especially rough and tumble play, running around outside is the most important thing young children can get. In When they're 10, 11, 12, maybe not so much physical play, but now they need to do a lot of social play, but in person. Games, um, sort of. Yeah, they still play games, but now they're doing a lot of social stuff, but they need to learn face-to-face -face social skills, but now they don't. So even in school, I gave a talk at my old uh, middle school, the place when, you know, when I was in uh, when I was uh, 10, 11, 12 years old, just before the pandemic. And I walked in the hallways and every girl had a phone in her. Every single girl had a phone in her hands and about half of the boys had a phone in their hands. And that means that even in between classes, you can't talk to anyone anymore because they're busy. They're all, all doing this. So um, so even before the pandemic, the social skills of Gen Z, the ability to start a conversation was severely damaged. It is going to be so much worse now because they have no practice starting a conversation other than through their phone. So I think it will be important for schools, for parents, for groups to put kids in situations where they do not have phones and they must actually talk to each other and they don't have to worry. They don't have to think about taking a photo for Instagram. They, they can't do that because they don't have a phone. I think we are going to have to take very proactive steps to make kids spend time with each other without their phones. And that will be very hard to do because many of them will cry, that many of them can't be separated from their phones. It's a part of their body. I'm not saying take away your kids' phones for weeks because that actually will cause some to kill themselves. It's literally the case that when parents punish their kids by taking away the phone, that raises the odds of suicide because you're taking away their whole social life. But at least for an hour or two, Try to find situations where kids can be together for an hour or two without their phones. And uh, and I, well, you mentioned the constitutional convention that will start uh, right in the in the next few days. But I want to ask you because um, the constitutional convention set up um, some special rules to include um, groups that have been marginalized in Chile for for a long time, right? So so it has, for example, special indigenous seats. Uh, we have a gender parity rule, which is the first one in the world. So the convention is half women, half men. Um, and, and sort of what we see is that uh, the, it's much more diverse um, in terms of social origin, territorial representation than the, our Chamber of Deputies. Um, that sort of um, touches upon the difficulty of interacting with people who think uh, very different, right? So. Um, how can we allow, I know you mentioned, for example, the, the risks of excessive transparency, but also how would you sort of um, allow for better interactions between people who have very sort of, well, you have written about this in terms of Republicans and Democrats, but different sets of values, right? They approach life uh, with different sets of values, um, especially in a, in a time that there's a lot of uh, questioning or a lot of uh, sort of debate on the limits of freedom of expression. 
Um, and we can we could apply this to other groups as well, but in particular to the Constitutional Convention. Yeah. So in my talk, I said social media makes it harder, Gen Z makes it harder, and I could have added a section diversity makes it harder. Diversity does not bring people together. Diversity divides people. Human beings are tribal. We are grouping. We very quickly divide into teams. It doesn't have to be by race. But if you if if people support different sports teams, we very quickly divide into into groups uh, for competition. Um, so diverse, the more diversity you have, the harder it is to reach agreement. Now, diversity brings some benefits to creativity and and representation and, and including all member, you know, all groups in society is a good thing for democratic uh, for democratic legitimacy. So I think it's probably a good thing to have broad representation. But I'm very concerned that you use the word marginalized, because if you have diversity and you use the American, the North American ideas about marginalized, how about power structures? Do people talk about power structures in Chile now? Yeah. So, so if you, so this is this is the ideas from. Sort of Michelle. the last part of your presentation. The. That's right. So if you have diversity and you have Michel Foucault, the the French theorist. Uh, Michel Foucault, who taught people to see everything as groups struggling to maintain their power. Everything is about power structures, privilege, oppression. Then I think it's very unlikely we'll be successful because to bring, have a lot of diversity and then say, we are the victims, we are marginalized. You are powerful, you are the oppressor. Now let's compromise. That's very hard to do. So I think you have a very, very big challenge ahead of you. Um, it's going to be extremely important for this very diverse group to have a sense that they are a group, that they have a lot in common, that they have to get this job done, that they can't leave until they get it done, that they're going to work together without people watching for the first six months, maybe just get to know each other. Uh, but if, if, if you have diversity, and American style identity notions about oppression, power, marginalization, and you have the public looking in, I would say there's no chance of success. But but so the society is diverse, right? So how would you say that, what are the key features for, for a diverse environment to sort of understand each other or at least um, connect with each other? Because what, what what I understand that you can say is that, or maybe they will sort of go back into their groups and sort of um, stay with those among who think the same, right? So I would recommend um, Peter Coleman's book. Um, Peter Coleman wrote this book, The Way Out, and he describes cases where people with very different values did overcome it, and they actually became friends. For example, a group of, of, uh, uh, of women who were pro-choice, in favor of abortion rights, and a group that were pro-life, that thought there should be no abortion ever. Um, and they were brought together to talk, uh, a small group, I think it was maybe 10 or 20 women, and they were brought together and they kept meeting for several years. And at the end of that, they were friends and they actually could work out compromises and they could agree on, on various policies. So um, if, you had, if, you had a, if you have small groups that can work together for years, then I think, and, and in private, without people watching, then I think they could they could do it. But if you're going to have big meetings with the concept that some groups are marginalized, uh, and you have outsiders looking in, then it's very difficult to overcome these group divisions. Oh, and well, you wait, and you need two thirds, and what whatever passes has to have two thirds of the right. Right, so so people have to come together, actually. At least a, a, a two-thirds what, majority. What happens if they don't? Well, then the convention fails. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you, John. Uh, I had lots of more questions. Um, these are interesting times in the world and particularly interesting and very challenging times as well in Chile. So I think your reflections and your presentation will sort of leave us thinking with a lot of things that will um, come upon on the next few months and years, of course. I, I hope that the leaders of the convention, representing all the groups, I hope there's like an executive committee or a, a group with just 10 or 20 people, whoever the leaders are, who can come together 
and get to know each other as people. Because if that goes well, and if the group really agrees, and if they get unanimous agreement, that will be a very good sign. So I don't want, I shouldn't be too pessimistic. I'm saying there are many warning signs. You've set up for yourself a difficult task, and then you've made it more difficult by doing some things that are understandable and perhaps beneficial for representation, but it's going to be quite a challenge. And if you fail, uh, and if the convention does fail, it won't be the end of democracy. I hope that you would then try again in a very different way that is perhaps more informed by, by social psychological research. Uh, I think you'll be successful eventually, but it, this might be very hard. And, and also the, 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 the referendum for having a new constitution, almost 80% of the people, and we had a higher participation rate, voted in favor of a new constitution. So there's a lot of hope on this. But everyone can agree that things are terrible. But when you have to, so every it's easy to pull things down, and it, and I I would not want a constitution that was created by by a dictator, um, but it's hard to build, and so that will be the challenge for the Chilean people. Yes, it will. Thank you, John. Hope to see you again soon. Me too, Isabel. Bye -bye. Amigas y amigos, espero que hayan disfrutado esta excelente charla que nos entregó ideas y reflexiones que quedarán para el análisis de cada uno. Agradezco a Isabel Aninat y Jonathan Hyde por la interesante exposición que acabamos de ver y espero que nos volvamos a encontrar muy pronto. Los dejamos desde ya invitados a la segunda conferencia que se transmitirá en octubre donde estaremos junto a Daniel Gilbert, uno de los principales expertos mundiales en la ciencia de la felicidad y en los errores en la toma de decisiones humanas. Es profesor de la Universidad de Harvard y ha ganado numerosos premios por su investigación y sus charlas TED han sido vistas por más de 20 millones de personas. Él nos ayudará a entender cómo tomamos decisiones y por qué razones a veces nos equivocamos al hacerlo. Especialmente en situaciones de crisis, los planteamientos de Gilbert son una herramienta tremendamente novedosa y útil para nuestros desafíos. Que tengan una muy buena tarde, un abrazo y muchas gracias nuevamente.